myth about it. I never learn, even though I get feedback about too many slides. Um, but what I won't do is is make this a rushed presentation. I'll make sure that it uh, is set at a pace that people understand, because there are a few new concepts, etc., to uh, to understand. Um, so, Michael, are you recording? That was the one thing yeah. I have. You are fantastic. I just okay. did it, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Um, I am guessing that we've probably got teachers, speech pathologists, um, learning support staff, uh, maybe parents, maybe um, uh, education assistants. So we'll have a range of people. And I'm going to talk about, a lot about grammar or syntax. Um, and so I am conscious that it's not a realm of study that everybody is familiar with. So if I say something and you're not familiar with it, please um, put in the chat to Michael and I and he'll stop me and I'll give you a better explanation. I'd rather go deep and correct than, than you know, uh, in, in a broad sense and just cover things superficially. Um, so I'm going to talk about upgrading sentences. And uh, for some of the kids that come in, they like, they refer to it as pimping sentences. And if you've watched Pimp My Ride, you'll know what pimping means in these days. It means uh, making things look better. Um, I want to acknowledge the fact that some of the content comes from, and these are the influences in my life and my studies, uh, Writing Matters by Billy, William Van Cleve. The Writing Revolution by Judith Hockman and Natalie Wexler, and of course, Talk for Writing by Pi Corbett. So they are big influences. And, and here in the clinic here, we've got a big, busy clinic with nearly 30 practitioners working in here. And we work a lot with students who have both oral and written expressive language difficulties. Um, so a lot of what we do is at the sentence level because it's the, at that level that students have difficulty expressing their ideas. So we know some things about English grammar. Now we could substitute grammar for syntax because it, it, it is in, in and one the same thing. Um, the research now is probably leaning more towards the concept of syntax than grammar and we can do that. Um, so grammar can be viewed as a set of skills. And rather than saying, what is a, a concept? We say, what job does it do? So we're looking at the jobs of different parts of, of the sentence to make sure that we are understanding how that word will fit into a sentence and what job it will do within the sentence. Grammar is about constructing and manipulating sentences to create different effects. And again, if we, this is what I mean, this is why I coined the term teaching form through function. Function means what job does it do? What effect does it have? And again, if we use that as the, the way that we couch the teaching of grammar, we've got a much more pragmatic and contextualized way to teach grammar. And it's also about tying text together so that writing is linked and flows. So that's what grammar is. It's not decontextualized, as you'll see in the next slide, um, because there's no formal evidence to suggest that the isolated teaching of grammar raises standards in students' writing. And what I mean by that, I was looking at um, a grammar book the other day at a school that I work at. And, you know, week one is verbs, week two is adverbs, week three is pronouns, week four is nouns, week five is pronouns. And there's just no connection to what those words do. If you look at the activities, it's like find the nouns, circle the um, the collective noun that goes with each animal, it just kind of busy work around the topic, but not actually enmeshing that concept into its useful context. Um, there's a lot of evidence to support the view that that teaching grammar and in context can be useful and it needs to be taught explicitly. 
we need a, a, a combined language of instruction where both the teacher or the speech pathologist and the student or the class understand what is meant by a thinking verb or a phrase, a, a, a time phrase or a connector or even a subject and predicate. You know, there's basic vocabulary or terminology that needs to be shared. So there's joint construction of meaning. And what do I mean by context? So I'm talking, I'm sort of talking about putting the teaching of grammar into a context. So one really, really useful context and the one that I'll be talking a lot about today is narrative texts. Because we look, when we look at the next slide, we'll look at the narrative hill and we'll see that there's really important times when writing a story that certain grammatical devices need to be employed. But what we know about narrative texts, that it's all about the verb. We really focus on the verb and what impacts and extends the verb in a narrative text. However, there's not the same opportunity to teach noun phrase expansion in narrative text. We could reserve that for expository texts like reports. If we're writing about great white sharks, then we've got a noun phrase that we can start to play with and expand. And that's much more uh, salient in an expository text. But also subject content like science, has and maths. And one of the things that Judith Hockman says is that all science teachers should teach English and all English teachers should teach science because in many respects, writing down what you have learned about photosynthesis is the best way to cement the learning and to experiment with some different clausal connectors. Plants lead, need light because plants need light so. Plants need light but. So just using those three sentences will allow you to cement a lesson, expand the student's understanding and teach them how to write using coordinating and subordinating connectors. This is a slide and, and I'll just say now that I will send these slides in PDF form to Michael who will attach them to the video recording. So um, uh, please feel free to use them. And if you have any questions or you want anything maybe in word form, then my email is at the front and you can just email me. But just briefly looking at the Story Mountain, what I was saying to you about needing to target different grammatical devices at different times within a context you know up here when we've got setting and characters we're going to use quite a lot of descriptive language maybe some imagery maybe some similes and metaphors certainly some adjectives and but then into the problem you're going to be using more dynamic lexical verbs ran jumped fell you know uh, stuck so here in the problem, you're going to be creating dynamic action. But in this plan and reaction stage, you're going to need to use more thinking verbs, wondered, decided, guessed, felt, because you're and then back into more dynamic verbs into action. And then resolution, again, probably more of those sort of thinking cognitive verbs. So you can see that even from writing a story, you can teach students to actually focus on different parts of the sentence at different stages of the um, narrative hill. Michael, are there any questions? No, you, no questions yet. Okay, I'll take that as a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So... What, what do I mean by upgrading a sentence? What is sentence complexity? Well, it's syntactic complexity. It's grammatical complexity. You can't say more about something without actually writing a longer sentence. 
you know, you have to, and you, and then you can't write a longer sentence without saying more about something. So the two, there's such a strong relationship between what we call semantics or meaning or content and grammar. So one has to drive the other. You've got to, to want to say more in order to make your sentences more complex. And, and Gillam and Gillam are a pair of researchers that have isolated four areas, what we call microstructure, so inside the sentence. What we looked at before in terms of the narrative here was macro structure, like the big picture, how a story works. Now micro, we're looking at it through microscope. And so the first thing is specificity of the verb. And as I said to you before, verbs are the heroes of narratives. But we need adverbials, we need the foot soldiers of verbs for elaboration. And I'm going to, this is what the rest of the presentation will be about. We need to elaborate noun phrases through adjectives and we need to connect ideas with a word in here. If we've got two ideas, we don't want them as necessarily as separate sentences. We want to connect them. So there's certain words that we can use to make those sentences connect. And I'm a strong believer in extracting the skill from the game. So if you're going, you know, you can't, while the child is writing the story about the day the, you know, Ferris wheel caught on fire, you can't say, oh, you know, while you're writing, I just want to, you know, add in some information about how to make those verbs more specific. You actually have to say, aha, uh -huh, what I can see here is that you're going to need better specificity of verbs. So let's just leave the story for a minute come out and I'll teach you about verbs, you know, making verbs more dynamic. And then you can put that information that you've learned back into the story. So my idea is to always have a story bubbling away for the students. Um, and I'm quite a believer in not letting them actually write their own script, but giving them some sequence pictures or something like that and say, we're all going to write the story of the day that two girls went to the Royal show and they jumped on the Ferris wheel just before it was time to get home. It caught on fire. The Ferris wheel manager tried a couple of ways to put it out, didn't work. And finally, um, a hot helicopter from next door in the pavilion, you know, threw a rope down and lifted them up. And then they were safely back on the ground. We're all writing that story. Yeah. Um, and that takes away the cognitive load. I think for too long, we've been worried about, about stifling their creativity. And so kids just get carried away with these random events that make no sense. And we don't want to rein them in because it's stifling their creativity. I say, I say rein them in as much as you want. In fact, give them very clear boundaries to the point where they're all writing the same story. But, and at certain times you take out, you, you move out of that story and you teach the, the devices that are going to be needed to, to move further in. So verbs, as I said, I love a verb, they're heroes. And what's so special about verbs? Well, they lend themselves to upgrading. So we know that there are common verbs, something like um, I got some flowers for my mum, so got, versus a slightly higher level of verb, maybe I picked some flowers for my mum, or you might want to even go higher and say I purchased some flowers for my mum. So got, picked, purchased um, have similar meaning, maybe picked is a little bit left of sentence, maybe we'll say got, bought, purchased, that's better, got, bought, purchased. Um, and But you're just increasing the sophistication of the verb. And I'll show you a, another example in the next slide. And they can be ordered according to tiers. And what I was just showing you then is got, bought, purchased is moving up from one, two, three, so making it more, more specific. Um, and quite often, I will just highlight all the verbs in a student's story and say, let's have a look at your verb choice. And I just did it today with one of the clinicians in here. She said, this, this story sounds really primitive. And I looked at it and I said, 
look at all look at the verbs he's used they were these i'll just move forward i'll show you um these got went said saw took found showed came had you know very ubiquitous verbs ubiquitous meaning they are um they mean a lot of things they're very common and so they're not specific go back here and we can use this as an example of increasing specificity which in turn increases the kind of the atmosphere around the action so if i said to you the old man went to the bus stop there's no clues about why or how he went or anything about the man versus if i said the old man hobbled to the bus stop this one here immediately you've kind of got a visual in your head you're thinking he's a bit lame or he's hurt himself or you know he's old and he's you know that's how he gets about but if i said the old man sprinted to the bus stop it's kind of discombobulates you a bit you're like what an old man sprinting hang on how does this work so already you're, you've got a new set of construction around that man and that's what a verb specificity can do it can create a lot of atmosphere around the action and the action relates to the subject so now we're thinking a lot about the man based on the verb we used This is an interesting exercise um, and it's one that you can do again with your students around increasing specificity. So one of the, the ubiquitous verbs that's always used is said. But if you look at some of the parameters that govern a word like said, you can say you think of a positive soft version of said, a soft negative version of said, a negative loud and a positive loud. So you're probably thinking about words like screamed or hissed or whispered. So immediately putting these conditions on, on selecting or shaping the verb immediately gives students the opportunity to upgrade and, you know, with good synonyms. And we've all got, I mean, these charts are fine, but they're not used by kids very much. You almost have to get them to generate their words. And so, for example, when I'm teaching older students um, how to write essays, I'll say, I don't want you to use used or made or showed. Yeah, I want you rather than used, I want you to use employed or utilised. Rather than made, I want you to use constructed, constructed or produced. And rather than showed, I want you to use conveyed or portrayed. So I don't want to see one of those low level verbs in your essay. And I want you to underline every time you've upgraded your verb. And that's sometimes what it takes to ensure that kids are actively using their new vocabulary in their writing this for my for my population of kids this is too passive just to put these up on the wall any questions michael not as yet no okay so we've been talking about what we call dynamic or in linguistics terms lexical verbs and they code dynamic action. You can see it happen. But there's another set of verbs, and they're referred to in the literature as passive or mental or cognitive verbs. And these occur at an internal level. So I could be worrying about something now or planning what I'm going to have for dinner, and you don't, you can't see any of that happen. They code perception. I can be hearing something, I can be smelling something, so I can be using a sense. Cognition, I can wonder, I can think, I can plan, I can decide. Or emotion, I can hate, I can love, I can feel sad. So these are really important because they promote the establishment of planning or reflection. And the interesting thing as well is that they demand more words after them. So if you've got something like, and I'll just flick over to this slide here. I understood 
you can't really just use one word. You might be able to use, I understood that story, or you might be able to say something like, I understood that the main character was evil towards the end of the text. So each one of these cognitive verbs by its very um sort of by the way it needs more words in itself will create a longer more complex sentence just a question we have yes. there jenny uh from carolyn slater she said what age would you start to ask for better verbs i would start to ask for better verbs in about year two probably i still think you know my belief is that Pre-primaries don't have, or see, our pre-primaries are your foundation, I think. So our year ones turn, uh, six turning seven, our year two to seven turning eight. So year ones are just learning to write. And, you know, I might in a class talk about increasing verb, you know, like making better verbs. But when I, with my population of kids that are very reluctant writers, it's not till we see them in about year two that we start to really hone in on their written expression. So I would say in a tier, a tier one level, whole class, you could easily do it at year one. At a, in, at a tier three level or a tier two level, which is small group or individual work, I would wait a little bit longer. These are some of the, and, and again, always teach verbs in past tense because most of the time the child will need to write in past tense, third person past tense. So when I'm teaching verbs, I always teach them in the past tense. And so this is just a list of, of um, verbs that you could uh, you know, put up as mental verbs. So what I'm talking about in terms of reflection and planning, if, you, if you've got a story about a dog um, and a puppy, let's say there's a puppy and it steals a bone. And okay, I'm going to say it in past. There was a puppy and it stole a bone from the butcher. And the butcher ran after the puppy. And so the puppy jumped over the fence and dashed behind the shopping centre and climbed up the hill. So we've got, you know, jumped, dashed, climbed, and we've got the, the butcher running after him to, to retrieve the stolen bone. And so, I mean, we can keep going with that dynamic action, but what we know from good writers is that they stop at some point. So we could say the puppy hid in a small hole at the side of the, the hill. He knew that the butcher couldn't find him. He wondered how long it would take the butcher to, uh, to lose interest. He decided to wait there for about an hour and planned to go home straight after that. So you can see that you've got that nice little interlude of reflection and planning and then you can start the, all the dynamic, you know, after an hour, he, he, you know, he snuck out of the hole and looked to the left and the right. And then you can go off with the rest of the um, story. So that's why cognitive verbs are useful or important, or I'd even say vital in writing narratives. We've got another question from yeah. Felicity Harpley. Yeah. Yep. What's your go-to answer as to why we need to teach grammar? My go-to answer about why we need to teach grammar is that we complain about kids writing all the time and our NAPLAN results in writing are terrible here in year three uh, in WA and, um, in, well, in some of the schools I've, I've worked at. And so if, I mean, how else do we improve written expression we can teach it at the genre level we can teach it at the text level at the paragraph level at the sentence level the phrase level and the word level so words of vocabulary phrases apart as soon as we go to phrases we're looking at grammar you can't teach kids how to write without teaching them grammar it's abs it's absolutely fundamental it's like saying you can't teach kids to swim without a pool. You have to have that context. 
and or maybe piano without a piano. Okay. <laughs> so what I want you to do right now is write me down one dynamic lexical verb for this dragon. Just write it down or remember it because I'm going to get you to do something with it in a minute. While we're talking about verbs, the beautiful thing about verbs is that you can teach personification. So you try teaching personification without teaching grammar because personification is about the verb and about the adjective because personification is taking a non-living thing and giving it a living verb. So if you've got something like the bushfire, what did it do that was animate? Well, it roared or it leapt, yeah? So you've got to say the noun, the subject, the bushfire, which is not living, needs a living verb to, uh, in, you know, after the bushfire leapt, the bushfire roared through the forest. And that's how you create personification. Or you use an adjective, the angry bushfire roared through the through the forest so if we're wanting to teach them how to use imagery we have to teach them grammar yep so these are just some examples of personification um and i'm not going to get you to do this but you know what you do you show them this picture and you say what tell me one non-living thing in this picture waves good Tell me a verb that you can uh, you can connect with waves that you would use for a person. Smashed, murdered. The waves smashed the rocks. The waves murdered the rocks. That's how you create personification. Yeah? Adverbs. So adverbs are the foot soldiers of verbs. They're strong reliable and flexible so if we want to add to a verb we ask ourselves these questions if we say the dog swam when did it swim and then we get an adverb of time how often did it swim then we get an adverb of frequency where did it swim an adverb of place why did it swim an adverb of reason. How did it swim? An adverb of manner. All we have to do is ask those five questions, and not all at once because you don't want all five adverbs in the same sentence. We ask ourselves those five questions and immediately the answers to them can be inserted into the sentence. And let's look at how that happens. And there's our dog having a swim. The dog swam. How? The dog swam silently. And here are some adverbs of manner. Where? The dog swam silently in the pool. How often? Every day. Now look here. As soon as you put an adverb at the beginning in front of the subject, you can see here, you need a comma. So now we can teach a bit of punctuation. Anytime you put a time phrase or a place phrase or a manner word, if we put silently there, silently, the dog swam in the pool every day, we would need a comma after silently. Next one is when. Every day the dog swam silently in the pool after his owners left for work. And the last one we've got is why. Every day, the dog swam silently in the pool after his owners left for work because he got so hot, okay? So we know that if we want to vary sentence complexity, we, we don't want to just say um, the dog swam in the pool, uh, the dog swam because he got hot, uh, the dog swam every day. So if we don't want to just keep using the dog, the dog, the dog, we can put the adverb at the front in front of the subject. And this is where it's really important. William Van Cleve um, taught me this, to teach kids about subject and predicate. Because what we've got is 
you know, every day after school, the dog swam in the pool. So the, the subject is in the middle there and you've got an adverb in front of it and then you've got verbs and, and adverbs after it. So if we can say to the student, let's just keep that subject in second place and put in different adverbs in front of it so you're not always starting with the subject words. So you can start with how. Quietly, the boy crept. When? Later that day, he fell asleep. Where? In the middle of the ocean, he blah, blah. So you can actually teach kids to start with adverbs rather than subjects. And what I've shown you here is that you can use them. They're so flexible. You can use them in any order. I won't read all of those, but this slide demonstrates that, I mean, some sound better than others, but you can basically rearrange adverbs and you can cut up sentences and, you know, and, and put different adverbs at the front and mix them up so that students know about the flexible nature of adverbs. Just a question from me, yeah. Jenny. I was always taught never to start a sentence with because. We had that discussion today, Michael. Uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So you you can. I mean, it's one of the few. You you can start with with um, coordinating. Beg your pardon. I'm going to say it again. Subordinating connectors. You. It's unlikely that you start with coordinating connectors like and or but yeah. or so. But you, you know, you think about it. If you've got subordinating connectors like whenever or unless or um, although, or even though, or because, you need to start them because you need to say something like, whenever it rains, comma, we always have to eat our lunch inside. Mm -hmm. Or something like, even though it was hot, comma, we still went outside without our hats. Yeah, so using that rule of putting subordinating clauses at the front of the sentence, because he's a subordinating connector and that goes in with that rule. Yep. yep. Okay, this slide also demonstrates the flexibility of adverbs. You can put that word slowly in anywhere, but always remember it has to have a comma after it, it at the front. They're called, Pi Corbett calls them fronted adverbials. Um, so, with your uh, verb that you used for the um, dragon, now see if you can write it. Just take one minute and write it. So you had the dragon, whatever, the dra dragon screeched or sword or whatever. See if you can add in when it screeched, where, why, how, and how often to get a really, you know, a really explicit sentence. And if you've got time, write it in the chat box and Michael will read it out. We had a question while we're writing here is how is important is it to teach children that children the actual grammatical names such as determiners, verbs, nouns, etc., rather than just demonstrating the function of them in their writing? That's from Carolyn Slater. Yeah. So I would I would be selective about what I chose to, to and um, different children you get different degrees of traction with different students. Um, you know, it is important because te English teachers, you know, and I've spoken to lots of high school English teachers, they all always take, well, not always, but almost always take it for granted that students will be able to understand and use terminology like adjectives and connectors and adverbs and verbs. 
Um, and I've had year 11 and 12 students where I've said something like, can you have a look at that poem and pick out the three most salient um, adjectives? And they're like, are, are those the, what do they do again? And, you know, um, and they don't know. So my suggestion is to, to start and, you know, we're writing a scope and sequence for the school that I work at in terms of grammar and, and looking at terminology, you know, how are we going to introduce nouns in grade one? And what are we going to call them? And how are we going to reference them? So nouns are things. In grade two, we might say nouns are people, places and things. In grade three, we might say nouns are names of objects, you know, so it just gets a bit more complex, but we always use nouns and we always give some examples and we use colour coding. So nouns are blue, verbs are green, you know, because they go, that sort of thing. So and we use colour coding in, in sentences. So blue, green, red, subject, verb, object. I think it's vital because someone's got to do it and it's got to be done in a progressive, cumulative manner. But the correct terminology, yes. You know, I don't use words like relative clause or subordinating clause or things like that with my with my students. You know, I do it on a need-to-know basis and some of it's just too complex and I can do it in other ways. But basic grammar, absolutely. All right, so we've got Diane Barwood says, in the midst of an eerie forest, sort of massive, terrifying dragon, Felicity Harper, every day the dragon soared swiftly over the mountains to be first to get his lunch. Bromwell okay, can I have that one again? Can I have that one again? Every, yeah. every day the dragon soared swiftly over the mountains to be first to get his lunch. Okay, so every day, that's time. The dragon sword verb swiftly manner over the mountains place and to get his lunch reason. Yep. Or it will, or probably every day is how often. So the so she got yeah. four. That's fantastic. But you actually have to, to consciously say, um, say, I'm gonna answer when, and I'm gonna say in the morning. And then I'm going to say where over the mountain, why to eat his lunch, how quickly. So now I'm going to put those into the sentence. It's that deliberate. Thanks. I think. Um, yeah. I think no, we'll move no, on. Yeah. I think yeah. No we'll worries. Power through. Unless there's a question about adverbs. No, there's just some interesting sentences. Good. All right, maybe we could put them in the say can you save the chat afterwards, Michael? Just I, I I'm not that technically proficient. Okay, I'll save the chat afterwards, Michael. <laughs> I'll be your TA as soon as everyone's gone. Thank you. Okay. We're going to talk about nouns. Now, nouns was not one of the things that um, Gillam and Gillam have identified as the most important teaching um, goals. However, in order to have adjectives, we have to have nouns because adjectives relate to nouns. Verbs and adverbs go together, adjectives and nouns go together. So nouns are really important for expository texts. So if I, as I said before, think of the nouns for a great white shark. So have a think, if you're writing about great white sharks, what are some of the other terms that you might use for them? You might call them, let's have a look at the next slide. The apex predator, king of the ocean, man-eater, killing machine, the most feared fish in the sea. And the interesting thing here is, from a reading comprehension point of view, children with language difficulties don't realise that all these things are talking about the same subject. So one of the things we need to do with children who've got language difficulties is have a look at the text that they're reading and see what the author has done to create what we call, it's called lexical cohesion, lexical meaning word, cohesion meaning sticking. So they're trying to get, you know, that, that shark word to be, to stick to all the other different terms. And in doing that, in writing a very good piece, it discombobulates the language impaired kids because they're thinking, who's now, why is this king of the ocean? Who's that? You know, so the whole time their levels, their levels of confusion are elevating. 
Now, the beautiful thing when you're teaching nouns, subjects, is that you can teach kids new subject, new sentence. And I've deliberately written this. Um, I'm just going to pull that down. Great white sharks swim off the coast of WA. So our subject in there is great white sharks. The next subject is some people. So what do we have to do? We've got to put a full stop there. Oops, I, know, I knew that was going to happen. Full stop there and a capital here because some people is a new subject. Some people want to cull these creatures because of the risk they pose. Ah, new subject. Surfers are surprisingly not in favour of shark culling. A new subject. Sharks are just doing what comes naturally when they attack and kill human beings. New subject, researchers. So you can see what I've done there. I've deliberately written that piece about sharks and every sentence has a new subject because if you're teaching kids about full stop, about sentence boundaries, that's one of the very earliest sentence you know, rules. New subject, new sentence. There's lots of other rules about when to use it. I mean, you can use connecting words in there, but if you're teaching punctuation, write a text like this or use this and show them that every time surfers, you know, researchers, sharks, people, they're new subjects, so it has to start a new sentence. Because our methods of teaching punctuation are not terribly effective, but if you teach them using grammar in terms of new subject then you've got a, a much better buy-in to the whole um, system. So adjectives, and again, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because adjectives come in order. So I'm going to go through quickly. They come in, the first one is a determiner, then quality or quantity, then size. So we, we can have something like the determiner, quality, lovely, big, cat if we don't say the big lovely cat we say the lovely big cat we have an innate order that adjectives have to go in and this and i'll keep keep going age followed by shape followed by color followed by origin mexican or japanese followed by material or behavior and here is a list of, and these are the sort of things that you can have in your room so that kids know which category they can pull from. You can describe the appearance of something or the personality of something or the feelings or shape or size, time, quantity, sound, taste, touch, colour, and qualities. So I think that's it, yeah. So when you break down, I mean, order is important, but not many kids muck up the order. That's kind of just an interesting aside that there is an order. But what we get is lots of kids using very simple and very similar repetitive adjectives. So to break that cycle, we say something like, I want you to, to describe this um, shell using colour, shape and size. And so, that you, and you can put them in that, that order, a big, a, a big white round shell. So you, you can have an order associated with it, but if you're pulling from those different categories, so these are the sorts of uh, posters to have up on the on the classroom wall and then say where did you get your adjective from oh okay you you keep getting it from size now let's see if you can go to color or shape as well to to upgrade your sentence uh, just a, a not a question here but a comment from pam snow would be incredibly helpful if uh first year uni students understood that a sentence requires a subject and a predicate this yeah Written work tends to be a chaotic stream of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I definitely agree. And in, you know, in teaching, like we had a child today that whose subject, he wrote something like, why it's hard, 
why it's difficult to play sport for all kids is because they're not very coordinated. So his subject was why it's difficult to play sport for all kids. So this this tangled, unwieldy subject that, and then you look at the subject, then you look at the little verb that comes after it. And, you know, you know as a reader, you're, you are discombobulated because you just can't determine the relationship between the verb and the subject. So I, I agree. And I've kind of, you know, partially because I didn't actually know what subject predicate was for most of my life. But once I once I decided that I was going to nail it and really work it out, that knowledge, that kind of like lifting of that veil has made it much easier for me to say to kids, your subject and your verb should be fairly close together, unless you're putting in something like a relative clause or, or a, a positive next to it. But it should be close together. And the further away the verb is from the subject, the more complex that sentence is. So that's what we also know about kids with reading comprehension problems. The further the verb is from the subject. So if I say, Michael, uh, a leading fisherman in the United States, won a competition last week. So you've got Michael won a competition, but you've got all those words in between. So absolutely. I couldn't agree I've just more. just got a couple of... Uh... Uh, questions, there's a couple of questions uh, asking about the slides. Yes, the slides will be available. Yep. Uh, Jenny's yep. providing those to us. Yeah, and that's okay. why I'm just, I'm not dwelling on some of those ones because you, sure. you know, it's just stuff you can just get. And if you need it in word form, just email me and I'll just send it up to you. And I don't Kristen know Anthian has also asked, um, she said she likes the graded image of verbs. Yep. Um, but And where is this from? Oh, the graded image of verbs, that's just me applying what I understand about tiers of vocabulary. That's just from the research, from Word Aware, Word Aware, that program. They talk about tiers of vocabulary. This is a great um, slide that I just saw on Twitter a couple of months ago. Um, and... Honestly, flip out to Bunnings and steal some of those paint swatches where you've got green going from light right through to intense and then write words on it like, you know, got, bought, purchased or in here, you know, look at worried, tense, concerned, anxious, worried, distraught. You know, these teach kids about vocabulary and about the intensity of the adjectives. So, if you're, you know, if you're always, if your kids are always writing sad here, you show them, well, that's the lightest colour word. And in when their girl's Ferris wheel is, um, you know, or we, let's say the girl's puppy died, she's not just sad, she's sorrowful. So we need to upgrade, whoops, sorry, up, upgrade from sad all the way up here to sorrowful. This, this is available at this link and you can get that. And here are some other good um, resources and I've got the link to those as well. Yeah. So you can, you know, you can download those and print them up. And, you know, if you look, I'm in, I'm in one of the clinic rooms at the minute and there's stuff on the wall, you know, there's charts and things like that on the wall so that we can direct students to where we have writing groups in here. Like I want you to use something out of this column here. Um, okay, that's just an activity where you change the adjective. These are from Pi Corbett, Talk for Writing. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you're, you know, I'm, I'm, suggesting that you need to understand what's happening within sentences. Often it's at word level, but you can actually teach at a text level here. And emotions carry, uh, adjectives carry emotions in stories. And again, we've done this using the widget online um, uh, 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 program where we've tried to do this. You know, we should probably put these on the same kind of colors as they're getting more intense. So going from afraid to frightened ashamed and embarrassed about the same but confused and doubtful moving up towards the end so 
again, showing kids how adjectives that convey emotion or colour or size or whatever have gradations of intensity. Beautiful vocabulary training here. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm moving, sorry, I'm moving through, I'm moving through, I'm moving through. Connectors, because I've only got eight minutes left. And I do want to address connectors. So what we know about writing sentences is that we can have two simple sentences. We can have, it was raining outside. We ate our lunch in the hall. Okay. It was raining outside. We ate our lunch in the hall. And we can either keep them apart or we can connect them but we need something there to connect them. It was raining outside. Ah, this is the consequence. So then we go to our consequence um, line of, of connectors and we say it was raining outside, so we ate our lunch in the hall or therefore we ate our lunch in the hall. And I'm going back to my original uh, point is that we need to know the job that these words do. We need to know that those words like while or when or then or whenever or before or after are all temporal. They tell us the time relationship between two ideas. We ate our lunch in the hall when it started to rain. There's no consequence there. It's a time thing. We ate our lunch in the hall while we ate our lunch in the hall while everybody else was out playing. Simultaneity. We know that there's adversative relationships. It was raining outside. We were allowed to play. That doesn't seem to connect. One, you wouldn't assume one goes with the other. We need an adversative connector it was raining outside however we were allowed to go out and play so teaching these it's all about teaching the relationship between this and this what's that relationship we're trying to code is does this causing this or is this a consequence of this or are they occurring at the same time is this occurring after or before this it's that's how you that's how you make simple sentences into compound or complex sentences by using these words to connect them and those connecting words establish the relationship between them I'm just going to show you um, here that you must have a comma up when you've got one of these words for and nor but or yet so. It was raining outside, comma, so we had to eat our lunch inside. It was raining outside, comma, and we were told to wait until it stopped. It was raining outside, comma, but we could go out to play. So again, using grammar to teach punctuation is really important. Um, and here I've just given you some examples because they're just good to have in your arsenal, to have examples of how uh, two independent clauses, our, job, our dog jumped in the pool, he hated the smell of chlorine. Two independent clauses that are joined by an adversative connector, but. So I've done that for um, the uh, uh, compound sentences and again for, here I'll show you, complex sentences. Because even though, and you can, and so with complex sentences, you can put the, uh, the subordinating clause at the front. And just a couple of activities to do. Um, I'll just show you. You can have one stem and a lots of endings. It was raining outside. And then you've got to think, you know, instead of this arrow, what do you put? It was raining outside because a huge storm rolled in from the coast. It was raining outside, but we were still allowed to play. It was raining outside, so it was raining outside, and then it started to hail. It was raining outside while we were at assembly. So again, some for some kids, you actually have to 
um, kind of gently force them into adopting these methods of coordinating and subordinating sentences. And there's a couple of other exercises here. Um, we can show kids what difference a subordinating connector makes at the beginning of a sentence while it rained we had our lunch in the classroom is different to after it rained we had our lunch in the classroom so this word establishes the relationship the temporal relationship uh, Kristen Anthian just asked what's your thoughts about the word for uh, yes is it a difficult one for students yes I never teach I never teach so in the fan boys I don't teach for Kristen I teach and so and but, kids will already be using and. I'll teach but and so. I still haven't quite got my head around why something like but is a, a, is a coordinating connector, but however is a subordinating connector. I did, I don't know, I asked Lynn Stone the other day and she gave me such a complex answer that I'm none the wiser. So, um, so I don't teach for, I'm very selective about what I teach. I teach pragmatically. Yeah. Unfortunately, coming from WA, the Dockers lost to Geelong. It used to be beat Geelong. I was on a high using this slide and now I have to write lost to Geelong. So again, showing kids what, the connector, how the connector changes the nature of the relationship between the first independent clause and any following clauses. Um, and this is the talk for writing, but so because. And I love this. A decimal is the same as a fraction because. A decimal is the same as a fraction, but. A decimal is the same as a fraction, so. How wonderful to round off a maths lesson, getting them to write the because, but, so, with the nature of the relationship between decimals and fractions. And this last slide is just me um, pulling together some icons. Um, what I think I'll do before I send the, um, the slides to Michael is just say, this is lexical, and I'll write it in there. This is a lexical verb, like an, a little, these are icons we use to show children where these things should go into sentences. So a lexical verb, a cognitive verb, um, emotions, time phrase, place phrase, connector, reason phrase, and descriptor. And I did it. 97 slides. Woo! <laughs> it's a And PPA. right on. Right it's on the PPA. hour. <laughs> well, well done, Jenny. Well, that, that was absolutely, yeah, that was fantastic. That, um, Thank you. I love that, it. That was, I love teaching it. <laughs> well, I, I think... Um, all of, I hope everyone was as impressed as I was, and I'm sure everybody was. So um, I, I think, and that's just an incredible resource for people to get as well. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your slides and your energy and your expertise because um, that was wonderfully valuable this evening. So I, um, I'm old now. I've got to get as much out, bef out before I fall off the speech pathology perch. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I won't comment on that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks again, Jenny. Uh, oh, this will be up. Um, I did press record this evening, so um, that's a good thing. So it will be on our uh, our YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh -huh. um, and next week, we did have Pam Kastner um, booked in, but we haven't advertised that recently because we've made a decision to hold Pam's um, session over for a keynote at the LDA AGM, which is coming up on the 28th of this month. Uh, so therefore I am currently negotiating for a replacement for next week and I can't tell you exactly who we've got. Um, however, I hope that we get someone and I hope they're at least half as good as you were tonight, Jenny, because that oh, was thanks, terrific. Yeah. So oh, thank you thank so much. You. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, and yeah. I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you. See Bye -bye. you guys. Uru.